This is Karen with NewClevelandRadio.net, and it is time for Heart Mojo with Melinda Smith. And Melinda, I'm really excited about tonight's podcast because a year ago, we talked to The Gathering Place, and we got a great response from that podcast. And I think we're going to learn more about them tonight, and especially your relationship to The Gathering Place. Right. So, yeah, it's important to me to have the gathering place on and to talk about it. Maybe it'll be a yearly thing for us because I'm a cancer survivor. In fact, that's how the podcast even got started. Being on social media, I would talk about what I was going through in videos and Karen started following me and she said, you need to do a podcast. And I said, well, who's going to listen to me? But here we are. Absolutely. Almost three years down the line. And the gathering place for me is important because it really helped me in many ways get through my challenge of cancer, the journey of cancer. So I want to welcome you, Jeff Stanicki. You and I have known each other a long time, and I'm happy to see that you're at the gathering place now. And Eileen Cohn, I don't know if I met you when I was there. Are you new or have you been there for a while? 22 years. 22 years. Well, I probably saw you in passing because my, I got my wig there and it was near, isn't it near the library there? Attached. Yeah. See? So I probably did come across you. So can you tell me a little bit, I don't know who wants to answer, maybe since you've been there 22 years, it might be you answering just how, you know, the gathering place got started. What's the background? I, I would be glad to share that. <laughs> So it was founded by Eileen Safran, and she has since retired, but she did an amazing job getting this going 22 years ago, and both of her parents had died of cancer, and she felt like medically here in Cleveland, they got good care, that we are really very lucky to have Cleveland Clinic and University Hospitals and Metro that are all nationally ranked, but she felt like emotionally, a lot of stuff was falling through the cracks. So she said, I want to open a place to help people cope. And from the get-go, she said, we're not competing with hospitals. They treat cancer. We help people cope. And so that's why the hospitals are glad that we're here. And she said it would be free. We do not charge for anything we do. And it would be for the whole family. So whether you have cancer or you love someone with cancer, you're welcome to come. So that's what really makes you different, right? Than some of the other locations, because you're working with the whole person, not just the medical piece, not just with their mental state, but with their family as well, their support network. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we only meet the loved one because perhaps their person with cancer has not been well enough to get Mm -hmm. out of the house or has been hospitalized the whole time, or even their loved one with cancer is even out of state. Um, So we've had people who are the spouse, the parent, the child, the sibling, Um, doesn't matter to us if you have a relationship to someone with cancer who's actively going through it we're glad to have you so what kind of things do you do for the families we have a pretty wide menu of services we don't think there's a right way to cope so we're not going to say well you, you should join a group or what you need is we try to offer a wide enough range that something will appeal to them. Mm -hmm. And it will appeal to them at different points in their journey. When you're newly diagnosed, your needs are very different than when you finish treatment. So a lot of what we do is around talking. So we have support groups for people with all kinds of cancers and for caregivers. If they're not a group person, that's fine. We're glad to talk with them one-on-one as well. We don't call it therapy because we are not diagnosing them. We are not keeping a chart or a record. We are supporting them emotionally through this Mm -hmm. journey. If they don't wanna talk at all, we have plenty of things that don't involve talking. Yoga and Tai Chi and Zumba and art therapy and cooking. I'm the librarian, so people can ask me questions. A library is often a place that is easy to approach. They might say, oh, I'm coping just fine. I don't need to talk to anybody, but I want to read more about it. And that's great. I'm, if that's the foot in the door, that's fine. And then they come here and they're like, oh, this is a nice place. This is, what else do you do here? And it might be their entree. Or for mm-hmm. you, like the wig was your entree. And then they get more involved in other things. And you guys were great because I played with it. Again, because of my social media, 
I was a redhead, I was a brunette, I had long hair, short hair, and we took pictures and I posted that and I talked about it after I walked out of the building. So it, it was fun and I appreciated that. Not everybody would give you that kind of time. I did come for, I think there was one counseling session, maybe it was a get to know, this was obviously pre-COVID. I'm sure we're gonna to get to COVID and how that made changes. But for me, when I sat there, and I don't think I've ever said this publicly, but I felt like I didn't want to be that sick. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I sat there and I, and I listened to the group and I watched the people in the group and I went, mm, this isn't me. I, I, so I used the services that worked for me. And so I think that may be an important thing for people who are going on this journey to understand that, you know, I believe you provide like you said, kind of where they're at, whatever level they need. I needed to see myself in a different picture. Yeah. If that makes sense? Does that make sense to you? Yeah. I needed to see myself there. And so that's why I did the social media things. A lot of it was for me. It, was, it helped me cope and helped me get through it. Do you find that when people come in that they may you know, they start one area and then they branch to something different. They don't stay there. For sure. And to respond to what you felt in that group, nobody wants to join this club. No, they don't. We, we have trained the front desk volunteers and the people that answer the phone to never say, welcome to the gathering place. You're going to love it here. <laughs> Because nobody wants to be here. Mm -hmm. And over the years, I've had people say to me, well, I was in your parking lot once. And I even had someone say, I was in your vestibule once. And they changed their mind because they really didn't want to be part of this cancer family. Mm -hmm. So you have to find it in your own way, in your own time. Nobody can make you. Nobody can peer pressure you. But we hope that once you find us, it feels comfortable to you. And if the group maybe has more people with more advanced disease and you're like, no, I have an early stage. I have every reason to believe I'm going to be fine. You find your niche there that you don't mm -hmm. have to be. But the people that have more advanced disease are glad to have their niche as well. Right. Right. You, got room for everybody. you work to support them wherever they're at. Exactly. Yeah. The, the grounds there, it's just gorgeous going in the back. That's very calming. It feels good to be there. I think when I first got there, again, as you pointed out, it was just that association. So I didn't spend the time there, but later I've been there multiple times before COVID <laughs> and it's lovely and very calming and very relaxing to be in the back. Can you describe a little bit or Jeff, you're sitting there very patiently. Maybe you want to describe. So you're talking, but a little bit about the grounds and the purpose of that. I'm actually going to let Eileen take you on the tour of the gardens because Eileen is our resident expert on the gardens and I would not do it justice. I, I, I make my way through the description, but Eileen knows innately the history the meaning behind each part of it and its planning um, and its execution and its uses. So Eileen is going to be the person that explains that. I'm coming back to you because you're going to be Oh, you can. To oh, yeah. Anytime. You know that. Yeah. Anytime. Can hey, in. Eileen, take anytime. it away. <laughs> well, and I will clarify, I don't know the names of any trees or plants, so I'm That's not okay. a gardener. We don't need that. But I know more, as he said, the symbolism and the, yeah. the logic and the reason and when we moved into this building, this is our second location. The first three years we were off of Richmond. And when we bought this building, the backyard was just mud. There was no garden. There was not one rock, not one tree. And we wanted the garden to be an extension of how warm and welcoming the building is. The building had been feng shui, the colors that were chosen, the furniture, the fireplace and the living room that you can sit by and warm yourself by. We already had the desire to feel warm and welcoming and nurturing. And we wanted that to be extended out into the garden. So the people that teach the Tai Chi said, we want a space in the garden where we can do Tai Chi out there. The art teacher said, I wanna be able to teach watercolor in the garden. So all of that was taken into account. 
the woman that designed the garden, Virginia Burt out of Canada, she designs spiritual gardens for a living. So that's a pretty cool thing. And so she asked us a lot. She interviewed us. She interviewed adults and kids and caregivers and survivors. And I like to joke that we got everything we wished for, but the hot tub. Um, which is probably not the safest thing. But you do have water there. We have the bubbling. Well, water breath. plays a prominent role. And so she primarily incorporated what we think of as North, East, South, and West, or earth, air, fire, water. And so wherever you are in the garden, you can hear water. It might be the river. It might be a jumping fountain. It might be just a trickling sound. But everywhere you can hear water mm -hmm. because of the soothing healing properties of being around water. yeah water is extremely healing for me when I need to restore myself I go to the beach whether it's the I prefer the ocean but you know Lake Erie's not bad when you <laughs> don't have another choice to go to yeah. it's the reason why I've done so many videos by Lake Erie actually I do a lot of videos at Hospice of the Western Reserve out in Euclid because they have beautiful grounds and they have the water behind me so it's nice to have that right in the middle of Beechwood. You know, that's have right. And Lake and, and, you know, Lake Erie is known as really one of the best places for sunsets in the world. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, we are very lucky for sure. We are. And, but I like the water aspect a lot in your, in your area. So would you say that that make, that's what really makes you different than a, than a cancer center that's like at a hospital, for example? Oh, yeah that of, of course they, they have their purpose and we need them. But for most of the patients we hear, they, when they wanna relax, they don't wanna go back to the hospital no. you know, to learn to meditate. They don't wanna have to pay for parking, walk a mile through the tunnels. You know, they want to be in a place where they can just pull up in their car and relax. And that there's nothing about this place that looks or smells like a hospital. Right. Um, yes, because of COVID, we're more antiseptic than we ever were. And yes, we wear masks, um, but it, it never will feel like a hospital. It will always feel very warm and nurturing. Well, the thing that's interesting is when you're in treatment, many times you wear a mask anyway, because that's part of your treatment to make sure you stay healthy or as healthy as possible, right? Mm -hmm. Don't catch a virus. So in for you it would be a little different but for the patient coming in or the cancer person coming in with cancer right they may be wearing a mask anyway and i'll, I'll give you an example that I, I wrote an article early in covid about how the cancer patient already knew how to behave in a pandemic they were already <laughs> washing their hands they were already avoiding crowds that kind of thing right and one adjustment that i have made on my job i teach meditation as well as be the librarian and when i think now that people used to have to feel well enough to get dressed and then they'd have to get in the car and fight traffic and then they'd come and they'd relax and they'd be all happy and then they'd have to get back in their car and fight traffic again now i'm doing it virtually We've been doing it for the almost two years, the full year and a half of COVID. Now I can see them on my screen and they're in their bed or they're in a couch and I see them close their eyes. And when we're done, I can just go night, nighty night and, and turn off my screen and know that they are holding on to that lovely feeling well into the evening, hopefully. So that's a good change from COVID. So, you know, Jeff, you came in during COVID, right? So you had to, to function in that environment. So you don't really know the difference because you haven't been there other than visiting maybe. Correct, in, right. Because you I, were in our industry. Correct. I, I haven't been able to see, you know, the, the, the space function in its full, you know, glorious way, if you want to call it that. Um, but I, I know that, that, the team at the gathering place learned to adapt in ways to make sure that participants have that opportunity to, to access them. And that is the most important thing mm -hmm. because this organization is made up of people and it's the people that provide the strength to help other people. So, you know, physical space, yes, important, but it goes beyond that. And I think, so much has been learned to be able to provide that type of support 
and and it, it will change how it's done in the future, not completely, but it's going to give people more options, which is actually a beautiful thing. So, so, so that challenge of COVID in the beginning that seemed so bleak for everyone and, you know, oh my gosh, these people coming in aren't going to be able to get help. The bright side is you found another avenue to Correct. provide that help. Correct. Right. So using, using technology, I mean, it, nothing replaces being together, right. For all mm -hmm. of us socially, um, there's so much importance to that, but, you know, being able to help because cancer doesn't stop, right. Treatment doesn't stop all those things, support needed for caregivers. None of that stops. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the beauty of it is how the team here adapted to that adapted quickly. And, and, you know, here we are, look at how much time we've spent with this and, um, you we know, all thought it, it would be a couple of months. Yeah, maximum. for sure. Two I'll years give another later. example if I can. Mm -hmm. Sure. So I also lead a welcoming orientation, which is a way for new people to get plugged in and to find out who we are and what we do and how and why. And that was always in person. And pretty early in, into COVID, uh, I was doing it virtually and realized that because I had the patient and the caregiver and then also an adult child of the patient all sitting lined up on a couch, I was really seeing their facial expression. I was hearing their tone. I was seeing who was getting tearful. And when the adult child, which is who often who says this, and you'll, I think you'll all recognize this, says, well, I think she should be more positive. I, I think she's not positive enough. And I think she should be getting out more. And the patient was like, oh, rolling her eyes, like, oh, I've been hearing this. And I could tell she was saying to herself, please don't back up my child. And I was able to say to all three of them, you know, we don't believe that. We don't think you have to be positive. It's a lovely goal, but you're allowed to be sad. You're allowed to be scared. You're allowed to be mad. And I could see the shoulders drop of the patient. Like she gets it. And the adult child was like, oh, <laughs> like you're not gonna back me up on this. I'm like, no, if you can be positive and that works for you, I will support you in that. But if you need to have meltdown days, I'm gonna support you in that too. Right. That wherever you are. And isn't it possible the adult child is saying that because she may believe that she's got to be positive. Right. And it's it's very difficult to look at your parent and know that they're uh, they're that ill. Yeah. All right. Course. Well, I think you don't know what to say. I mean, I'm I'm sure you've had uh, people come in, you know, cancer people and and have them say, Oh my gosh, somebody said the stupidest thing to me, right? Because people don't know what to say. They are afraid editor. themselves. They don't want to say the wrong thing. Ultimately, they usually do say the wrong thing because they're just they're just doing the best they can. And I think children do that as well. I think everyone tries their best. I think they're speaking from the heart and their intentions are pure. And we can just help them think of, let's rephrase that a little bit. Let's right. let's tweak that so that you, the person with cancer knows they are allowed to cry. And then you as the caregiver know, oh, I'm allowed to cry too. I don't right. have to be strong for them. They can see my emotion. I can see their emotion. We don't have to protect each other. We can all put our cards on the table. Right, right. I, how many people did you see coming in now that delayed treatment? I think COVID caused a delayed treatment. I'm very connected to the breast, can I had breast cancer. So I'm very connected to that community, not only those that have treatment and they're in remission, but those who have metastatic cancer. And I've read and seen and spoken to many people who waited. They waited because of COVID. Did you see that? Did you notice that where people are coming in going, gosh, I, I really shouldn't have waited because now, have you seen an uptick in that because of COVID? What I've seen is delays in diagnoses and then delays in treatment. And I think more so early on when hospitals were really panicking and thinking, oh my gosh, we need every bed we have, we need every ventilator, we need every everything, that they were postponing for months radiation 
or chemo and saying, you're, you're okay, we, we got it out surgically, this is just in case, but the people were freaking out. They're like, wait, mm -hmm. if it wasn't COVID, you would be giving me chemo and radiation right. now. And so there were people that were very afraid and that in between time of diagnosis and then not getting treated is horrible. It's like limbo, I call it airport time. You're not home, mm -hmm. but you're not the place you're going right. either. So yes, I, I saw it more, I would say a year ago in the spring, right. not as much lately, but now I'm hearing the beds are filling again. Yeah, the, you know, it's, it's hard because you get this diagnosis and you want to treat it right away right? And then even before COVID, you still waited. Yeah. It was, I think I got my diagnosis in, I want to say end of March, maybe beginning of April. And it wasn't until the beginning of May that I actually got in to see somebody and then start a treatment plan for myself. Now I chose to be part of uh, a group where they tried a couple of different things first. So before I actually started my treatment so they could see if it helped. And I was glad to be part of that because maybe that'll help somebody else. Mm -hmm. So I chose to do that, which extended it a little bit longer, but I was still being treated. Mm -hmm. I think um, coming into COVID and out, not uh, completely out of COVID, um, I think you're right though. I do think that people are being a little more aggressive and going and seeking their treatment now, right? How do you, how do you end up getting your patients how do you get end up getting your participants do they come from the hospital maybe i'll turn they... that one over to jeff because <laughs> he's become our primary hospital liaison okay yeah i mean there's many different ways that that people come to us um obviously one way is is through their health care providers right their health care providers providing us um the referral to our organization at least to get the person um the door opened to, to knowing who we are and, and what we do and how we support them. So that's, that's mostly the primary way that people would reach us. But let me tell you, there's a, there's a huge um, word of mouth opportunity as well. Um, you know, a person knowing someone that's been uh, served by us, a person having a friend that, that knows someone that's a friend of a friend. Um, so it comes through many, many different ways um, that somebody reaches us. Um, obviously, you know, we, we view the, the, you know, a personal introduction by someone as very helpful in that, like Eileen explained, you know, someone, you know, coming to the parking lot or just to the vestibule and, and not taking that extra step you know, uh, 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 someone that that provides the entree to us via an introduction of some sort makes a huge difference because it takes away um, the the thought of fear that that there should be fear and or the stigma behind it, right? Or the stigma behind it, exactly, exactly. Do you find um, the cancer support, the other cancer support groups, like the ones on social media mm -hmm. or in the area, are they supportive in, in bringing people in? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, not, not, every, not every organization is everything to every person to fulfill their needs. So I know Eileen will tell you that many participants, you know, work with us for certain things that they feel they need. They can get other things from their health provider. They can get other things from other support groups. You know, people, there's different faith groups that have support groups. So some people will, will purposely want to seek out that support from multiple opportunities to have that support. And we're right there with them. I mean, we want to make sure that, and, and we'll, and Eileen will tell you as well, we'll, we'll cross refer as well for other, other uh, levels of expertise. So I know you, you work with the whole family, how you, I'm assuming you have children's programs. So what kind of children's programs do you have out there? So we are glad to meet both with a child with cancer or a child who has a mom or dad or grandma or grandpa with cancer. Um, the, the second group is the larger group that we deal with. And mm -hmm. so, so often those children, you know, of, 
age four, six, eight, ten, 10 are, are basically being told, shh, mom's tired or shh, don't bug dad. And we're trying to change that whole dynamic so that they use the word cancer, they understand the word cancer, that even if they knew someone, a grandparent or a neighbor that did die of cancer, well, what type was that? There are hundreds of types of cancer. Mm -hmm. And this is what mommy or daddy has. And we're doing everything we can to follow what the doctors say. So with kids, they can join a support group. And on the nights of the group, we call them the littles and the mediums and the bigs so that the, um, the littles aren't hearing the F-bombs that the teens are dropping and the teens aren't having to deal with, oh, you always put me with the kids table, that there are leaders and groups for every age level. And then the adults are getting together to talk mm -hmm. about how do you help kids, that the focus is on the family. Right. The family wants to come in for one-on-one -on -one or with the child or with the whole family, we're glad to do any, any combination, we're glad to do that. And for the children with cancer, we're really pretty lucky that again, the hospitals in town, they have music therapy and art therapy and child life. There's a lot that hospitals provide for kids with cancer. So um, we don't see them as often, but we're glad to, to offer help to those families as well. Do you feel that the teenagers are pushed to come? Because I have to tell you, I had my sons were 15 and 18, turning 18. The 18 year old was off to college. The 15 year old was by himself with me, helping take care of me because I was separated. So I was alone, technically. I mean, I had my sister in that, but he was the one with me in the house. I could not, I tried to get him to come. He did, he wasn't interested in coming to talk. In retrospect now, if somebody's listening, I would encourage them to kind of gently push that teenager because I can look back and even now he'll admit that he had a hard time dealing with it. But at the time I couldn't make him come. So you know, what do you do with, how do you encourage a mom or a dad who's going through this process mm -hmm. saying, really, you should bring your child in or your young adult in? Yeah. So do do I, have, I have two reactions to that. One is to your situation. Please let your son know it's never too late to talk to somebody. Okay. So we are, we're, we're, we're here mm -hmm. for whenever. So if he says, I'm processing that stuff again now, glad to talk to him or anybody that is, you know, if, even if it was several years ago, mm -hmm. it comes back, P buttons get pushed. There are. Oh, reminders. absolutely. And I know what they are with him. Okay. And so you can even use that as your entree of, I know your buttons. Do you want to talk to someone else? Mm -hmm. So if it's a teenager now, rather than dragging them to a group where they might be forced to talk, which we would never, ever force someone to talk, we suggest bring them on a tour. So all we're going to do is walk through the building. You're going to see this amazing garden. You're going to see this amazing art room with the kiln for pottery and every art supply you could ever imagine. You're going to see the library. And then you'll get to pick. And so they can come without any obligation, without any expectation, and just kind of see. And hopefully they too might go, all right, I'll try it. Mm -hmm. I think that's truly part of the challenge because as a so I'm a woman who's dealing with breast cancer. And the and mine was not early stage. So, you know, there was a lot more risk. I was had more to worry about in my mind. But then I'm a mom, right? I have children. I have one going to college. I have one home. And so I think it's important for anybody listening that, you know, that is a challenge and you can help them work through that challenge. Because maybe the, like myself, I really didn't want to talk, right? So what do you do with somebody like me? I mean, I'm pretty aggressive in how I handle my life. So I did what I needed to do there. And then I really didn't spend any more time there. Again, in retrospect, I wish I probably had spent a little more time there. What do you do with someone like me who comes in who doesn't really want to talk about it? Like, I'm fine. I'm going to get through this. How do you work with that person? We, we give you permission to be you. That if that's what you needed at that time, it wouldn't have helped if we had said, now, come on, you wouldn't have, you would have resented if we had done that. So we meet you where you are. And we also, both with teenagers and with adults, we say, well, do you have someone you can talk to? Mm -hmm. And if the teenager says, I've got a best friend, I've got a teacher, I've got a coach. Okay. 
as long as you've got someone you can talk to. So I might have with you, if you had said, I'm not going to come much, I might have just said, do you have people that you really trust and could really speak your truth to? And if you said you did, I'd say, great, maybe they'll come with you sometime and do yoga. Right. I think, you know, and I'll, I'll share like some of what Eileen is explaining is the work of just providing, educating someone to say, you, you need to have a friend, you, you know, educating people that that's helpful to you. Not that we have to be the ones that provide that support, mm -hmm. but we can, we can educate you on what things to seek out to have support. And I think that makes a big difference too, especially for a young person. Well, I know. I think ahead, friends, Karen. I think friends and family need to be listening to this podcast because sometimes it's up to a friend to take you by the hand and show you what's out there. Because, you know, if I had known Melinda back in the day, you know, knowing that she was separated, knowing that she didn't, you know, she was trying to take care of her son as well as herself. She may have needed that friend who would have said, here, come with me. We're just going to go on a tour somewhere. Um, and friends and family can't know what you're going through. Right. We have to experience it with you and let mm -hmm. you tell us. Well, you know, I think my, my, the way I handled it, I had a plastic surgery background. I worked in plastic. So I was very familiar with breast cancer, very familiar with reconstructive surgeries. So I came in more educated, very educated actually on the topic. So because of that, I kind of felt I could handle it or I knew more about it. Maybe that was just my opinion, my thought. And so I took social media as my way to deal. So during my social media, I would talk about spending the day on the toilet and I would make, you know, say it's okay to feel that way. I posted a picture of a jewel encrusted throne, you know, a toilet, and I made fun of it. Oh, I, I couldn't go to work today. I had to sit on my throne all day. That was my way of dealing with it. But again, in retrospect, I, could have used, I think, a little bit more counseling at the time because I just chose to keep myself busy, working, moving. That's kind of how I handle most things like that, right? If you don't think a lot about it, you're going to just get through it. I'm going to jump in because I have one more comment, but I also have to leave because I'm leading the welcoming okay. and I have someone logging on to join for the welcoming. Even if at the beginning you didn't want to come, we also talk about when you finish treatment is the second most stressful. Newly diagnosed, highest stress. Finishing treatment, second highest stress. And it's because you feel out of sync. Everyone around you is like, yay, let's yay, throw a you're party, done. you're done. But when you finish treatment, you've just had chemo put in you. You feel like crap. Right. And when you feel out of sync is when you might seek us out. Um, right. So I'm going to log off, but I'm going to encourage anyone to reach out to me personally. I'm glad to talk to anyone. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. We appreciate it. Thanks, Eileen. Thanks, Eileen. Jeff, you're going to answer my last couple questions. Sure, absolutely. So this service, if someone's coming in, are there any costs associated with it if somebody's no. looking to do this? Yeah, that's an easy question to answer. There is no cost whatsoever. Um, all of our services are free to the participant, to their family members, to their caregivers, anyone that wants to access our services, they are free. So we, she mentioned before about, you know, the most stressful time is when you're diagnosed and going through treatment, when you're done with treatment, that's the second most stressful mm -hmm. time, because you don't really know where you are at that Correct. point, right? You've Correct. gone through all this, but what does happen is every time you go for a checkup, there's stress. Mm, there is. Because there's always that worry, are you gonna find something? They talk about it on every social media group that I belong to. It's like, oh, yeah. it's time for my scans. Everybody puts up prayers that it's gonna be okay. Yeah. So do you have groups that she mentioned, You know, it can continue, like my son could still come if he wanna talk. Do you find that you have people coming back for that? Just oh, yeah. to deal Abs with the post-traumatic stress? Absolutely. Absolutely. We have you know, we have single programs that that address that. So they'll come they'll come up at various points in the year, often quarterly, 
they'll be, you know, it's, it's just a program to check in on that. So, so it's not only the support groups, but the individual programs that address issues that, um, that people may be feeling, feelings that they're feeling, et cetera. So that is part of our, our normal calendar, if you want to call it that, of, um, of opportunities to, to either, you know, intersect, keep your eye on it to, to, you know, to know that, that we're here, um, regardless of where you're at. So yes, those opportunities are there. So it's kind of fair to say the gathering place is a safe house, no matter where you're at on the journey. That's exactly right. Whether you're starting or whether you're far into the road, because it really doesn't ever end. Right. It's, it'll always be. Yeah. People think they're done, but it's always there. There's always that underlying piece. Sure. Um, one other question I have is, how, what's your percentage of men, women? Do you find women seek out more of this than men do? Yeah, absolutely. You know, our our largest demographic is female. Um, and, you know, we are working hard to to really break down barriers. Now, now with that said, we have a very strong uh, prostate partners group um, that that is made up of, of men that are going through treatment, having gone through treatment, um, and their significant others. Um, so that's why it's called prostate partners is because, you know, it's not a prostate support group. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's got a different makeup to it, if you want to call it that. So, so men need support often in ways that are different than, than a woman, um, you know, and, and it's always, we have a lot of things that are based on individual types of cancer as well. Um, but, but by and large, yes, because, because that's, that's the nature of, of, um, uh, individuals that would seek help, Mm -hmm. but we're working hard to make sure that, you know, people don't just know us as a place that they know us as an opportunity to, to seek support and then to be well-rounded as far as who we're providing support to in the community. So there's a lot of strategy and, and, you know, working towards ensuring that we have, there's access to us, um, every East Ohio. Mm-hmm. Do you feel that there's a, enough people coming so you can form the different types of cancer groups? So esophageal cancer, for example, or stomach cancer, or is there a general group or no, an there- individual? There is, there is, I mean, you know, you're, all you need is one person to start the need for something. Um, so, so yeah, yeah. We, we don't find that to be, you know, an, a true issue, if you want to call it that, that, that there are opportunities to connect. And, and even if it, th- there's so many more general things that it doesn't have to be cancer specific for someone to, to find support that they need. So my last question for you before we tell people how they can reach you is, I've known you for a while. You worked in the healthcare industry. What made you decide to make your move to Gathering Place? Well, you know, two things. Uh, you know, obviously the, the opportunity presented itself by, um, by my interaction with the CEO of the Gathering Place. Mm-hmm. And we had been colleagues before that. And, you know, she really explained to me, she said, look, we're, we're looking to, to, um, grow this organization in ways that, that serve the community and all people in the community, you know, would you consider coming on board to help us do that? And, you know, what, what answer could you give, but yes. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so mission driven. So, you know, what you see is what you get with this organization. And that is, truly, truly a committed staff and it's a small staff. So, so imagine, you know, someone like Eileen, who's been here for 20, you know, over 20 years that is, was here from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that's, that's just rare. And, and to know that, that, that commitment is there, um, you know, cause I had to do some real soul searching to make sure that this was something that I, you know, would want to do. Uh, I don't make decisions very lightly when it comes to that. And, you know, I just knew, like, I just knew it's hard to explain, but, but I knew. No, I get it because that's really part. When I talk to people about getting through challenges and journeys, sometimes the answer is there, the change is there, and you know, it's the right thing for you to do. 
Yeah, exactly. So, and I'm exactly. glad that you're here. Oh, thank you. Thank you. What you were yeah. doing before was definitely worthy, but I'm glad that you've made a, a leap and a change and it's, you can help propel yeah. this forward to more people. And hopefully people will watch this podcast and understand a little bit more about the gathering place yes. and what it can do to help them on their journey. Yes, absolutely. No matter what level. So how do people get in touch with you? There's several different ways. You can always call at 216-595-9546. Or of course, visit our website, touchedbycancer.org. So those are two ways. Or you could always look us up and visit one of our two physical locations. And that is in Beechwood on Commerce Park or in Westlake on Center Ridge Road. But obviously the websites usually lead people right to where they need to go. Mm -hmm. So, right and the phone number, always so, can call. Jeff, I have one question. So we know that the gathering place is here in Northeast Ohio in the Cleveland area. And not every city, every state has something like the gathering place. If somebody's listening to this and says, you know what, that's something we need to start. Is there an opportunity for dialogues so that others oh, absolutely. learn? Absolutely. Yeah. We, we have, we, we would call sister organizations, you know, across the United States. Um, you know, some of the larger programs are in Chicago and, and other, just other parts of the country. Absolutely. And we actually have now, we mentioned COVID. Um, we have people participating from places like Hawaii Ireland, Florida, um, you know, because of the ability to do just like this uh, virtually, um, it's kind of growing the participant base as well. So, so that was a benefit of COVID for people yeah. across the country or around the world, actually, that they are able to understand what you do and participate in what you do to help. Correct. Them. Correct. Yes. Well, thank you, Jeff. I really appreciate you being on and, you know, I appreciate um, your time and thank getting you. the message out and maybe we'll do this again next year. This is our second time. So absolutely we'll look forward to it anytime. And we appreciate you too. So Karen, thank you. Melinda, thank you. And, and have a great evening. And we so appreciate, you know, you're helping us uh, spread the word. Well, you're welcome. And anytime. You're welcome. Take have care. a great day. Have All right. Have a great everybody. evening. Great day. Bye. Bye now.